But we think that whatever happens in the church in America is what's happening to the church around the world. But in your experience, that's not the case, is it? Not at all, thankfully. Uh, No, in fact, uh, the church is growing faster today than it's ever grown in the history of the world. Well, welcome here to the True North Podcast. We have our very first guest, Mr. Bob Beasley. Welcome to the studio, Bob. Thanks, Chris. It's really good to be here. I'm so glad you could join us today. You should feel honored. You are the very first guest in this podcast. I was uh, surprised, and I am honored. (laughs) And uh, I I love being a part of uh, new and uh, and things that get kicked off, and particularly in the media. Uh, I've I've been a part of media for a long, long time, and so, uh, so love this. So your background especially was radio for a while there, right? Like in terms of your media interaction? Correct. Uh, it started actually when I was a young guy and, and my, my best buddy got involved. I was, was part of CBC Radio in uh, Thunder oh, Bay, cool. and, uh, where I grew up. And uh, we became friends when we were newly married and, and uh, got to know radio a little bit. And then in my first church in Brockville, the local little AM station, uh, called uh, Three Pastors and said, uh, later in the evening, we want to have an open line program. And Anybody can call in and oh, ask yeah. any question they want about religion. It was called God Talk. And so there That's was, awesome. a, there was a, a, a Catholic priest and myself and a Baptist pastor. Sounds like the beginning of a joke. <laughs> we, we walked into a radio station. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Uh, anyways, we we never knew what was coming, what phone call was coming. Sometimes mm. it was a legitimate question about the Bible. Right. Sometimes it was about uh, share our testimony or who are you. And yeah. other times it was, uh, you know, there was those who were opposed to the, uh, the the Christian faith. And we had some pretty good discussions about that. But, you know, the three of us together uh, usually came up with a pretty good answer, I think. So that got that started. And then eventually I, uh, I ended up... Uh, uh, being the director of uh, a ministry, a radio Bible teaching ministry here in Canada, and did that for a few years. Mm. So yeah, uh, still do a little, little tiny, little two and a half minute daily um, Bible. Just, Is it still called ba- like yeah, what do called, you call this segment? Words, it's called Words from the Heart. Words from the Heart. Still on, uh, uh, still on a number of radio stations across the country. That's so cool. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, so, that's yeah, really so radio really has been my uh, my uh, focus. Did you spend time in the bathroom perfecting your radio voice? Did you try different uh, tones, or did you just just kind of dive into uh, you it? You know, I, I just got thrown into it, Chris. Fair and so, uh, no, no, not really. Um, I, I, we joke at home that Wendy uh, says I have the, the, the perfect radio face. <laughs> uh, you know, old joke, but my voice is my voice, and and I guess it's it works. Okay. Yeah, it works I guess really it's well. Okay. Yeah. Now it's not just radio. Like I was trying to figure out in terms of an introduction, you've you're a Renaissance man in a lot of ways when it comes to ministry. You've done a little bit, almost of everything. You were a pastor, a church planter. Yes. Uh, that was down south, wasn't it? Yeah, we directed uh, youth and children's ministry in our denomination's district out out west mm-hmm. for a few years. Uh, pastored a couple of churches. We went to Florida. We're Canadians, but we went to Florida for eight years and mm-hmm. planted a church in the Florida Panhandle. Came back to Canada to uh, went from the church that was brand. Brand new started with four couples in a retirement center dining room. Wow. Found out later, by the way, that you should never start a church in a retirement center or a funeral home. But I didn't know <laughs> that, so you know we, we, we were just young and we were winging it. So fair enough. Anyway, so eight years later, we came back to a church that was at that point uh, seventy years old and you know had a lot of history. And uh, so what a what a contrast to with a new church. You can try pretty much anything you right. want, uh, and uh, and let's see if it if it works. And if it doesn't, we'll try something new. Like tearing down the walls each way, this way, continually widening your sanctuary. Yeah, we, Isn't yeah, that what I know, you did? Yeah, we talked about that, Chris. That's yeah. what we did. Yeah, by the end, because we were in a, we were in a rectangular uh, concrete block school, old school. What we did, yeah, we literally did that. We would knock down classroom walls. So by the time we left there and we were running hundreds, uh, we, the, the sanctuary was still the same width, the classroom width uh, this way. And like seven, six classrooms long, you land the <laughs> 747 on the platform because it was so long along the front wall. Anyways, but 
but yeah, it was it was well, those were wonderful days and mm-hmm. wonderful days in the church uh, that I came to here in in uh, in Chatham, and uh, he loved pastoral ministry, mm-hmm. uh, loved it. But. Yeah, even though you have gone to parachurch ministry, you still have a heart for it. Whenever oh, we talk, I have that sense. For absolutely, you. you still absolutely. have a heart for it. Yeah, I'm still I still consider myself a pastor, even though mm-hmm. I'm not pastoring a church, uh, gifting wise, you know. Yep. Um, uh, I'm a pastor. That's my yeah. heart. So, and you have a strong gift in encouragement. Has it, people have obviously told you that before. Off the chart. Yeah, I actually do a, a, a seminar on discovering your motivational gifts okay. based on the seven uh, motivational gifts found in in, in Romans twelve, right? Uh, and the seven listed, and one is the exhorter, which is also the encourager, right? Uh, kind of in the spirit of Barnabas, you know. Yeah. And, and yeah, I'm I love- off the chart. I'm off the chart. Yeah, I love Barnabas. Me like, too. I just love reading about him. Sometimes yeah. I wish I could lean even more into his gifting. I yeah. think that's that from the other side of the fence sometimes. I, I, look I at love that the fact think, that he took Saul, Paul yeah. of Tarsus, underwing. Uh, despite, Paul the, was, despite the static, despite the friction. Exactly. Paul yeah. wasn't convinced that the, the other apostles would accept him. Right. And it took Barnabas to come alongside, right. put his arm around Paul and say, I'll introduce you to the, to the guys. Yeah. Imagine right. imagine if he hadn't, right? Oh, like imagine yeah, exactly you know paul can't even but, but paul became as we all know paul became just such a, an, an integral part of those that, that apostolic group so now you're working in missions correct and so this has been a for the last 10 to 15 years or so yeah i was with uh, i was with the radio ministry and and was uh, overseeing their global ministry for a while for the last uh, 12 years now, I've been with a ministry called Bible League Canada mm-hmm. uh, as the, uh, I'm now senior vice president. I was chief ministry officer. Uh, and and I, I do give oversight to our work in 50 countries around the world. So you told me the story once, and I just want to see if I remember it correctly, but you had to, you had to get a new passport before it was actually expired because I you did. had too many stamps <laughs> and they literally couldn't stamp you anymore. There was no more blank space. My passport was completely full and it was the fat one. You used to be able to get a fat one. Right, remember, yeah. Remember the, 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 the twice as thick one yeah that was full yeah that's pretty it's, amazing yeah it is yeah I'm I'm, I'm 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 just kicking down the door of 100 countries that's that's yeah, crazy I'll, I'll, okay yeah so uh if you had to pick one and i'm sure you won't want to your favorite country that you've ever visited i, I get asked that a lot okay it's a very common like just personally question. just for your own personal self like forget if, work for a second if, if your favorite country if that you've I ever could, visited well uh, i'm uh, i'm a canadian so and there's no place i'd rather be than home i've but, heard you say that yeah uh-huh. but outside of canada um I, I i love southeast asia I, it's hard okay. to pick it's hard to pick one of the countries there uh, I just uh, I love. Is the, it the sunsets and the mountains? Is yeah, it the ocean? What the, is it about? It's the uh, food because I'm a bit of a foodie. Okay. And I think uh, I think Thailand and and Laos have some of the best food I've ever eaten. Interesting. I love it. Um, I, I I love, but then I love Africa. I, I love the mm. people of Africa so much. What is the people? And that's and, true. And people are uh, people are wonderful, wonderful. When I look back on my life, and everybody has seasons, everybody has spaces that they reside in for a while and move on. Bible college for me was this like super transformational space, and that ground became almost like holy ground for me because so much formative ministry life, mm-hmm. friendships, relationships. I met my wife there. It's just, it's almost kind of like hallowed ground for me. But the funniest thing was I went back to visit maybe 10 years after. If you go one year after, it's still, you kind of know some of the people, you know, some of the professors. I went back 10 years later, didn't recognize a soul that was there, barely knew a quarter of the professors. And all of a sudden it wasn't the same place for me. And it made me realize like maybe for the first time that it is people that make anywhere that you are. It's the people that make the place and not the other way around. Yes. And I'm so blessed because on Facebook, I've, you know, I've got, I think over 2000 friends now on Facebook and, uh, and they're from all over the world. Mm. I feel so rich. You know, mm. I, uh, uh, I just had a note on WhatsApp the other yesterday morning, uh, from somebody over in actually in Eastern Europe 
just saying how you doing and mm. what's going on and you know and so uh there's just good people everywhere yeah. that you know uh the, the people i mostly connect with are are also followers of, of jesus right and they love the lord and uh, people wherever i've been whether they're christians or not they, they love their families mm. they love their their spouses they you know they 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 we're there's a there's a there's so much about us as human beings that 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 crosses any cultural barriers hmm. you know uh basically we're human beings what unites us is infinitely greater than what divides oh, us absolutely absolutely huh. it's why uh you know we look at the world right now that's in such turmoil hmm. uh wars and rumors of wars and right. and uh, and yet you see uh interview the common people who are the ones who are caught up in this hmm. uh and in this case uh many of them are even in the army that have been caught up in this right that don't want to be there and it just goes to show you too that so many circumstances around the world aren't so simple Mm -hmm. when you're up close yes everything is simple when you're far away you can look at a situation and say ah oh, they should do this and they should do that when you're far away but when you get up close to it you realize that it's a lot more complicated than just a simple answer yeah absolutely i was talking to a friend of mine in myanmar which has been going through a very very difficult time right now we don't hear much about it here which is really too bad but as you know they had a democratically elected government it was overthrown by yet another military coup mm. and uh, christians particularly but other minorities are being persecuted over there and uh, I was, remember talking to a, a, a friend of mine that I know we were actually standing in what was the uh, former residence of the British governor mm. when it was a British colony, when Burma was a British colony. And I said to him, uh, like, how do you, uh, what do you think when you're standing here? Now it's a national garden, belongs to the people of Myanmar, mm. to the Burmese people. And I said, like, do you think back and, and say, you know, this, this beautiful place, huge, uh, used to belong to the British governor? What do you, what do you think about that? And he said, uh, you know, uh, if, if, if we had done what Canada did and just separate from the UK peacefully, mm. Uh, the UK was ready to pull out of Myanmar anyways, out of Burma at the time, out of Burma anyways. He said we should have just let them pull out when they wanted to and we would have a democratic uh, system. But he said instead we had a revolution and look where we are now. Mm. So I, I, that was not what I was expecting. No. I was expecting, you know, yeah, we're glad we got rid of them. And, right. But they look at history now and, uh, and uh, there's so much that... Uh, is just hurtful and painful and, and just people that, are caught up in that and they're 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 not guilty of being a part of any of that they just want to live their lives yeah. in peace but when chaos reigns it's Every, anybody's guess what the next kind of movement the next regime the next militia is and it seems to just go on repeating itself over and over That's again so sad. yeah you know, uh, uh, even in the case of the U.S., I, I often tell my American friends the difference between uh, how the U.S. was birthed and how Canada was birthed has made a huge difference in our culture and psyche. For sure. Uh, and I say the difference is alphabetical, and they want to know why it's alphabetical. Hmm. I said, because you were born with a revolution and we were born with a resolution of the British Parliament. I said it's alphabetical, uh, yeah. same word, resolution or revolution. But I said, look at the difference in our mindset yeah. as Canadians uh, against the Americans. I think yeah. that's really at the heart of uh, much of the issues that the U.S. is facing right now. Interesting. How they're birthed. So, uh, and, and, and isn't yeah. that funny how character and how perspective can transition through the generations? It's a of culture course. of things that continues to imprint parents to kids, kids to grandkids. Absolutely. And it follows through in their thinking. And, I mean, and that's I a biblical... In the States, and I have lots of friends in the States. I mean, I pastored a church in the States, and everybody in our church, except for one other Canadian... <laughs> We're all Americans. I love mm. them. I, I, yeah. I love the American people. I, 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 I'm not an anti-American in any way. No. But there is a different mindset. And I've thought a lot over the years about where that might have come from. Mm. And I think it has a lot to do with how our two countries were birthed so that's, differently. That's fascinating. Which country that you work with from a ministry perspective are you most excited about? 
Oh, and I know oh, like yeah, which one actually because I work in 50 countries and, right, and, and I'm I work sure there are national partners who are my friends right. and, and, and many of them watch YouTube so when they Fair find enough. out I'm going to be on here they'll be watching this well maybe so, tell me one of the okay, one let of me tell you because, because globally all of us who are part of our ministry yeah. understand what's happening in Thailand at the moment mm. and uh, the uh, Thai, Thailand has a really fascinating missions history it's a it's a overwhelmingly Buddhist country, as we all know. Mm. And uh, missionaries have been in, in Thailand, was Siam, now Thailand, for 200 years wow. of, of Christian missions. And 2% of the Thai population are believers, mostly in the cities, hardly any uh, until recently in the rural areas. It just, uh, f- really? 200 years of ministry, hardly any believers in the villages. Hmm. What happened was there's a, uh, there's a brother who uh, is a mechanic and went into the city from his uh, rural province to, uh, to be trained to be a mechanic. And while he was there, he met Christ hmm. and went back to his province and uh, has, uh, has decided that he needed to share his new faith with the people in his village. Uh, he's an amazing leader. Uh, unbelievably intelligent and uh, strategic planner off the chart. So really? he didn't just go and start to share the gospel. He said, what is the best way to do it in our cultural context? And he designed a way. And, uh, and so uh, there's a, uh, there is a move of God happening in mm. rural Thailand right now. Um, before the pandemic, uh, I was at their first mass baptism where they baptized about 800 people. Wow. Uh, and uh, since then, about every three months, they're baptizing well over 1,000 people in villages everywhere. So they've gone from this one fellow who, who leads this fellowship of churches now uh, to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of churches in hundreds of villages all over rural Thailand. And it, it was, it, there's That's been amazing. some reports you hear about it, Christianity Today magazine. Had I hadn't heard about it. Yeah, it's just unbelievable. So, wow. the, it, but to be there and to see what God is doing uh, in Thailand. Um, and, and the good news is that those kind of stories can be, can be told about so many places hmm. in, the, in the majority world. So, this is something that I wanted to talk to you about that I thought was really interesting is that sometimes living in Canada or living in the States, we have a very narrow view Mm -hmm. of what the church looks like about what's happening in the church. And there's this idea, like maybe it's built into this American exceptionalism, right? Like this idea that America is the center of the world, right? And North Mm -hmm. Americans sometimes as a whole, we, we may inadvertently feel that way, but we think that whatever happens in the church in America is what's happening to the church around the world. But in your experience, that's not the case, is it? Not at all, thankfully. Uh, no, in fact, uh, the church is growing faster today than it's ever grown in the history of the world. It's it's growing by. That's, it's unbelievable how quickly amazing. the church is growing in what's what's known in 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 um, geopolitical circles as the majority world, which is the global south and east. Okay. So uh, anywhere south of the equator, uh, in or, or in, uh, even uh, I would say south of Europe and but Africa, Latin America, mm. uh, Asia. Uh, the, the Christian church is growing in mm. staggering numbers every day, every day. And uh, the Middle East as well, by the way. Really? Yeah. And yeah. it's shocking because every news article I've ever read is all about the shrinking, the amazing shrinking church in North America and all the ways the next generation is struggling to connect. But I think in my conversations with you, it's been an encouragement to see that the church as a whole is is growing like crazy around the world. We've uh, we've got to know Dr. Todd Johnson uh, from uh, from uh, in the, he lives in the U.S. Gordon Conwell, mm. and uh, he he pro- he's the producer, the editor of uh, of the, the the most in depth uh, review of world Christianity that's available okay. today. Operation World. You can I, I remember getting that book in Bible college. Well, like, it's still yeah. They produce it every two or three years. Okay. Yeah. And uh, Dr. Johnson is the one who coordinates all of that. And uh, he's spoken to our team a couple of times. We just had a, a conference of, uh, of all of our global leaders uh, not long ago. Mm. And, and Dr. Johnson spoke of that as well. The statistics are staggering, like staggering with the growth at the moment. And the, the beauty of it all is that, um, is that uh, it's, it's, it's all indigenous. It's culturally... So- is growing from within 
And I feel like now I'm not a missionary myself. I've always known missionaries connected with them. You've probably had much closer eye on both the history of missions over the last 40 years or so and those who are doing it. But from the little bit that I know, it seems to me that there was a time at which um, the way that America did missions was they would go to a place in Africa and they would teach everyone to wear blue jeans and <laughs> button up denim shirts and yeah, yeah. dress the part, look the part, adopt our same hymns and songs. Yes. And then the missionary eventually would come back and someone else would go. And it was a very, um, I don't know what you would call that style of missions, but it was a very replicate oriented North American Christianity. We want to export North American Our Christianity culture. around the world. We were, the Christian culture. culture yeah. Right. Or and, in fact, even North American culture, the uh, the the most interesting and memorable church I've ever been to was uh, in Ethiopia, hmm. and we got out of the car and uh, were met by. We do all that we do through partnerships with nationals, so we don't send missionaries overseas. And so, that's a big shift, isn't it? Though compared huge. to like forty oh, years yeah, ago, yeah. Somebody somebody told us that we're uh, we're thirty years ahead of the curve. That's really doing cool. this, using the model that we do. We don't send Canadians overseas. Hmm. We don't produce anything in Canada to be used overseas. Uh-huh. Our partners all produce their own culturally all homegrown con- contexted uh, materials. We don't print Bibles and send it overseas. They're all printed as close to local really? as we can. Yeah, uh, all in the language that they request, the, the translation they request. Uh, you know, and so uh, because there are mature leaders now in in now there are still there are still a number as some say up to 1600 people groups that have no gospel contact at all and missionaries are needed hmm. there although some of the most uh, impactful are those from their own countries but, but, but they're going to their Samaria to cross culturally right. within their own region you right see. and so um, so but but there are mature believers now in in every area of the world and in fact uh, we better get used to in Canada not being the center of global Christianity in the in, in, the, in Canada and the states we're working through that in our ministry what does mm-hmm. that mean yeah. does that mean that uh you know because there's way more christians in nigeria right. than there are here in canada way more right. just in nigeria uh that's just one country in africa we, uh, there's going to be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of christians in africa in the next 40 years that's amazing it's just reminiscent too of the revelation picture of the church the diversity uh, every yes. tribe and nation and tongue that yes. picture it sounds like so much of that is coming to tr- coming to pass right now there's a verse that jesus gave uh, uh there's a verse in matthew 24 14 and that those who are uh, focused on eschatology which i'm not i my, my life focuses on uh global ministry but right. but those that that really focus on eschatology uh, i think often miss and those that are praying for the return of Christ right. often miss. And uh, we all love the, the, the end of Revelation where John says, even so, come Lord Jesus. Yeah. We, we, we long for that. But, but listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Right. right now, the word nations we usually think of as a geopolitical unit. So Canada is a nation. The United States is a nation. Uh, Congo is a nation. Um, Vietnam is a nation. Uh, that's what we think of. But the word actually in the Greek is ethnos, from which we get the word ethnic. Mm. And it literally means people groups. And what I learned early on in global ministry was that the world really is tribal. As, as we've seen more and more over the last absolutely. five years. Absolutely. And so not so much here, except maybe among our indigenous population, but, but pretty much everywhere that you go in the majority world, they will know what people group they belong to. Right. And though that, that is the definition of ethnos. So, uh, and this gospel shall be preached as a testimony to every people group and then and then the end will come right that's what jesus said and so we are called to global impact hmm. uh, we imagine fascinating the, the, chris the, the, the theologically yeah. uh, we have a role to play in bringing jesus back isn't that amazing 
profound. And it's funny too, because so many of us, if we're too focused on eschatology, too focused on end times, we mm -hmm. think that we're watching for certain wars and certain earthquakes, yeah. but really the sign of the coming of Jesus that immediately precedes it will be the gospel will be preached to all nations. Yeah. And there's about, at this point, it's figured there's a, a different groups Right. There's a ton of mission groups now, of fellowships and organizations out there, but but and they all have a slightly different number depending on how they 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 figure it. But right. but there's about fifteen to sixteen hundred people groups left in the world that still do not have any part of the of the Bible translated in their heart language. That many. That many. And but they're mostly dialects of larger language okay. groups. Or, and, and again, I'm not a I'm not in the translation business. I, right. I'm not a I'm not an ethnologist when it comes to to understanding dialects and, and languages. I don't but other than what I've I've read and as a missiologist. So so uh, but there's still about sixteen hundred and, and there are groups uh, that are working diligently on 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 getting at least a portion of the Bible yeah. into those languages. Wyclef being one of those incredible they're, they're, they're groups. Incredible groups. Yeah, they're really working. I was just that. reading this week at the time of recording that this was the anniversary of William Tyndale's mm. uh, murder and martyrdom for right. translating the Bible into a commonly yeah. readable language. Yeah. Like, can you believe how far we have come since in, that in, point? In a few centuries. I know. Yeah. I know. There was a time at which translating the Bible was a death sentence because yes. you wanted more people to be able to read the scriptures in their own tongue and yeah. that got you killed. Uh, let, let's, for example, take uh, North Korea. Uh, ever since the Korean War, 1953, I think it was, was uh, 54, before I was born anyways, uh, they, they signed the armistice. And uh, North Korea was created, South Korea, two separate countries. In all of those 70 years... Uh, the, the two languages have, have, have become different dialects. I bet. And so, for example, uh, in North Korea, there's a, uh, there's a word in North Korean for ice cream that I can't pronounce. In South Korea, it's called ice cream. Ah, uh, interesting. Because of the Western because influence. Because of the Western influence. Yeah. So it has a word in North Korean that is Korean. Right. And, in, if and you what want began? To order ice cream in South Korea, you just ask for that and they'll bring it to you. Yeah. Uh, and, and so there's a, there's a wonderful YouTube video on, because somebody's created an app. Uh, which is used by Bible translators, by the way, mm. uh, and the differences between. So, if a South Korean is talking to a North Korean, they 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 can use this app, and it will help them to translate. Even though the bulk of the language is still the same. Yeah, there's there's a number, and so this is a you can you can Google YouTube search on YouTube for yeah. it. It's a very funny little thing because That's fascinating. the southern uh, the, so they're giving words, and the South Korean will say one, the North Korean will say where that word is, and then and then the the uh, the, the South Korean says McDonald's. <laughs> of course, the North Korean has no word. No for idea McDonald's. what that is. <laughs> oh, what Dear. a cultural symbol that it's is. It's true. Hey? So, wow. so now they've just just finished. Uh, we just actually published it in uh, a brand new translation of the North Korean dialect. Uh, which is really hard to get into North Korea, but uh, there are ways. You can even see that too. Eugene Peterson, I'm yes. a big fan of both yeah. his work and the kind of underpinnings underneath why and how he did what he did. Yes. Many people have opinions on the message. Some love it, think it's the best yeah. paraphrase translation it's that's paraphrase. out there, and it is a yes. paraphrase, not a yes. translation. Yeah. Other people just eschew it because they're like, no, it's nowhere near close enough. But what I noticed that was fascinating to me is even the English language is so culturally appropriate and so specific that the translation that Eugene used for 20 years ago when the message came out roughly or so have already changed. Yes. So even some of those euphemisms and stuff like that, the way that he tried to get it in the common tongue of the people has already changed since then. And if he were to do it again today, I bet you he would change a third of the way that he communicated. I'm sure the message, because it was so culturally specific to that era and that time. He's not the first to do that, by the way. No. Uh, uh, James Moffat, back in the be beginning. Uh, I've of seen the, the Moffat translation, uh -huh, right? yeah. Uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, which I've been reading through again lately. I, I found it was one of my grandparents' Moffat translations. Really? 1901. 
uh, I found it so I've been reading through it. It's just fascinating. Huh. It's you know, but you can tell it has that kind of genre of right. that period. And then um, Phillips translation, which came later in the nineteen right. forties, fifties, halfway through the twentieth century, did the same thing. So the message was nothing new in its in this kind of I, interesting I concept. It just was for the nineteen nineties. So what do you think made it so transformative or so shocking for people? Is it because we become so reliant on a select few translations, like the NIV or the New King James, and then this was something new, or? I wonder what it was that really captured people's imaginations with that. Um, I think uh, I think the, the, the people have to understand because the Living Bible was a right. precursor to that. So right. that was 20 years before. And it was, people hated it too. Dynamic parallel, right? That's the idea. That's like correct. The sense so, as opposed to a word by yeah, word. Yeah, and so so as a, as a pastor and preacher, uh, would I preach from the Living Bible? Right. Or would I preach from the message? Never. You know, you can't exegete right. from a paraphrase. Right. Uh, uh, but would I use it as uh, illustrative? Yeah, absolutely. I would. I think right. you know, you know, and I would usually say, "No, here's Eugene Peterson's take on this." Right, right. So that you understand that, and it's almost like it comes full circle for our discussion because what a translator's job is when they're in a new people group and a new ethnos or ethnic kind of group of people is to give them a sense of the Bible in their own words. Yes, and that really was the heart behind. If you if you look at the story behind how the message came to be, Eugene was in the middle of a Bible study for the Book of Galatians, and he was preaching and teaching before a service on a Sunday morning, and all the people were gathered around listening, and they were bored to tears. Mm -hmm. They were not interested in any way. They're stirring their coffee cups the whole time. And he knew he was losing the room. You know that feeling when you're yeah. losing a room? It's yeah. just for a pastor. It's like you can feel people fidgeting you with can. their candies Absolutely. and yep. checking their phones. What goes through a pastor's mind at that point, yeah. for those who are listening to my pastors, <laughs> is time to wrap this thing yeah. up. <laughs> it was the for whom the bell tolls moment of the sermon. And for him, he was like, no, they need to understand the fiery language that Paul was using here in Galatians. Yes. So he just put it week by week into words that they would understand. Yeah. And it just grabbed them like of that. Course. So, yeah, it has that same element of cross-cultural translation kind of baked into it, which is really interesting. It was a missional, the, the message really was a missional document where yeah. he was trying to reach his people where they were at in language that they could understand. Which every, I, as a pastor, like I, I resonate with that. Uh, absolutely. Every good translation that that will will be accepted by the people whose heart language it is mm. will have people from that group as a part of the translation project mm. you have to a, a, a local like a somebody local, who a understands local context knows. somebody who's yeah. a part of the committee sitting around a table like this breaking down every verse right. from the original language and saying how how would this go in in this in your thinking and your mindset and your right. heart in your heart as a part of the people or group that speaks this language. And even stuff like uh, when the Bible talks about wheat and fields of mm -hmm. wheat, when you're going to a part of the world that has never grown an acre of wheat in their in their entire history exactly. of that civilization, they have no context Absolutely. for it. So, so you, it's you fascinating. Use rice or something right. instead. And to, to and to some of us purists you might feel like, no, that's not correct, but every element of ministry to some degree is a certain translation. Yes. Like even the translation of God into flesh, the incarnation was a type of pure, the purest of form translation. I, I, I love uh, even Psalm 51 when you're preaching Psalm 51 in the context of a, of a jungle where it's 45 degrees and the humidity is 100%. Right. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, these people have never <laughs> seen snow, have no concept of snow. So when you're uh, preaching that, yeah. you have to contextualize it. Yeah. Let me tell you, you have freezers in your refrigerator. Yes, you do. Yeah. Okay. Have you, has it ever... Uh, so you go that way. Yeah. You, you, the ice in the ice box. Isn't it beautifully white and pure? Yes. That's what they're talking about. Oh, I can, I can get that. We'll just take them on a road trip to Winnipeg well, or that'll Thunder do Bay, it. right? I know, exactly right. Oh, boy. No. A pilgrimage of sorts. <laughs> Teach right. what Psalm 51 really yeah, means. Exactly. So when you think about all of your time on the mission field and the partners that you've interacted with, what is it for us as Christians in North America, what should we be learning from these people that would actually make a difference in our lives? What is it that we should be internalizing? What could we learn from them? Because so often we have that reverse mentality, right? We're going to go to the ends of the earth and we're going to teach them all about what it means to follow mm -hmm. Jesus. As someone who has seen it firsthand over and over again, 
what, what what's something that we could learn from them about following Jesus? One of the interesting things, Chris, is that they live in a non-Christian context, hmm. and they're fully aware that they need to somehow take the gospel and contextualize it so that their their neighbor or the people in the next village can understand uh, what the gospel is. Not that you change the gospel, right. not that you change the message, but you contextualize it. Jesus did that often as he was right. walking and teaching and saw a fig tree and used that right. as an illustration. Uh, so they're, they are very much aware that they live in a non-Christian culture. Mm. So uh, I think sometimes Christians in Canada and North America still live under the false impression that we live in a Christian culture. <laughs> yeah, fair and enough. So I see Christians in non-Christian cultures wrestling through, how do I share Jesus Hmm. in this culture. So, so for example, uh, when, uh, when the gospel is shared in the context of Southeast Asia, it always begins with Genesis and the hmm. creation story. Because in Buddhism, there is no creator. Really? Buddhism has no God, has no creator. Hmm. So Buddhists do Buddhist things, but they're still always wondering, how did we get here? Yeah who created us, who brought this world into being. And, and, and Buddhism gives no answer to those really important and foundational questions. So in the Buddhist culture, I mean, if we were writing something that would uh, sh share the gospel in a Christian context, we assume, although it's becoming decreasingly so, that the person we're talking to has some idea about a, a person called God. Right. But in a Buddhist culture, they don't have that. Hmm. And so you start with the basics. That's how you contextualize. Right. So uh, uh, back to Thailand, I, I sat in a little village where the gospel is just going, and 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 the leaders have a book with no words, the word, and and it has pictures of Asian animals, and it begins with creation. Huh. God created this world. We're going to tell you more about the God that, that did. So, uh, so we need to wake up here and realize that we're living in a post-Christian culture right. where people don't have a concept of the God of the Bible. Yeah, whether we like it or not, whether we, whether we had any part in making it what it is now, this is the reality of the world that we live in. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think we need to spend way more time than we are, and this is what our friends globally teach huh. us, in figuring out how to share the good news of Jesus Christ in a post-Christian world. In a way that they can understand. Correct. Because those building blocks, they really aren't there. It's shocking. But the number of people that I meet that have never even heard of Jesus, Ever, that in, live in, in Canada, this country, don't even right. know. I've had people ask me, why do you have that like cross-shaped thing on the top of your church? Yeah. And you think, <laughs> how could you <laughs> of, not know that? Of, of all things not to know about yeah. church and Christianity in a country like this, how right. could that be? But that is, that's it's the true. reality. Who have never set foot in a church for anything other than a funeral. And even if that, because more and more, and I'm noticing this, people aren't even having funerals in churches. They're not having or pastors weddings. conduct or weddings. Mm -hmm. It's just if they're doing a ceremony at all for these kind of cultural moments of movement and change. So that's really interesting to, to remember who we're talking to. And I mean, that's preaching 101 too, right? Yeah. Who's your audience? Yeah. You know the message, you've studied the message, but your next question is, who's the audience and what does God want to say to them? And then how do I teach this to them? And maybe we've lost that Here to a certain have. degree. I think uh, I use the illustration of a driving by in Canada, the average uh, Canadian driving by, let's say a Hindu temple or a, or a mosque. Mm. And uh, they've never been inside there before. They're not exactly sure what goes on in there. Mm. They drive by and they might wonder what goes on right. in there. Uh, and maybe they think it would be interesting or maybe they think it's strange or maybe they think I don't understand it. Right. And why well, is there a crescent on top? Why is there a crescent? Yeah. We have to realize as Christians that there are many, many, many Canadians yeah. who drive past a church and say, yeah. I wonder what goes on in there. Yeah. Maybe it's maybe it's good. Maybe it's strange. Maybe it's scary. I don't know. 
Hmm. So, I mean, there was a day when you just have to open up the door of the right. church, invite people to a supper. There was a cultural memory mm -hmm. of sin, right. of righteousness, yeah. of church, of salvation, of yeah. Jesus. There was a cultural memory to which there isn't there anymore. Isn't. As you're saying that, it just makes me think just how important it is in our current cultural context to show the world that Christians can and do love each other and yes. care for each oh. other and the unity of the church. Yeah. Because if they know nothing about us, genuinely know nothing about us and they see fighting and division and just acrimony inside those walls, I think there's a reason why the, the New Testament is so clear that they'll know us by our love. Yeah. Uh, there's an interesting uh, um, article in the, the current edition of Faith Today, which is the, for those who may not know, is the uh, magazine of the Evangelical Fellowship of Canada. And, and Canadians were polled about what they thought of evangelicals. Mm. And they have a, genu a, a generally a negative view because so they're sad. not seeing that love. Right. They're not seeing community impact. Evangelicals see uh, ourselves as friendly and right. and reaching out into the community and right. you know doing doing stuff to make the community better but the the the, the average canadian doesn't see that mm. and that's a huge problem yeah that's a huge hurdle to overcome when yes. you want to share the gospel if Absolutely. there's already a negative kind of stereotype that's that correct. you're working your way out of yeah now, so you, you've been in ministry, uh, you're a couple of years to my senior, maybe one or two. I think maybe one or two <laughs> decades, but that's okay. <laughs> you've, been, you've been around the block longer than I have, and you've experienced ministry in the States. You've done it from a church planting perspective and, and around the world. I was curious before our you know, planned kind of discussion today, I was curious what you thought, how has the church changed? Over the last 40 years, like if you think of when you started in ministry, when you were in that school or planting that or that uh, yeah. retirement home <laughs> when you began, right? right yeah. When you were there, yeah. how has the church changed from then till now? What are the biggest things that stick out to you? Yeah, when I was in my first church, I, I went to a weekend conference put on by Christian businessmen, CBMC, uh, on the future of the church and faith in Canada. So mm -hmm. this was 1982 or three, so a okay. long time ago. Yep. And it was prophetic. They were right on. I watched it happen. Really? Mm -hmm. They said that Canada right now, it has three three different groups of people uh, when it comes to Christianity. Okay. There's this large, go to church, this is the early 80s, uh, not necessarily born again and redeemed, but good moral, ethical, good living, good trying citizens. to live by by whatever they think biblical rules and standards are okay. here. Uh, there's this small group of genuinely born again, loving Jesus, sold out to the gospel, sold out to Christ group. And then there's this there's this middle group that is is not in either one of them. Uh, they just they don't go to church and you know they're 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 kind of moral, but have no thought for, uh, and they said, what's going to happen in Canada in the next 25 years is that this group is going to shift to this group, uh -huh. this large group of moral, go to church on Sunday, but not necessarily have a relationship with Christ right. is going to shift to this middle. So this group here will be much smaller. Huh. We'll be about the same size, which is really interesting. Yeah, and the middle now will be this large group of I don't go to church. I'm basically a good person. Right. I don't go to church. I don't have a biblical worldview. I don't understand what the Bible says, but I love my kids. I love my other. And they're basically in the middle. And what they said was, we got to figure out how to reach now this group. So what's changed in the church in this bunch? Um, I think I think what. There's some things that haven't changed that ought to have changed. A friend of mine said this. This is really interesting. I think he's right. Too many churches find it easier to change their theology than their order of worship. <laughs> oh, man. And he yeah. said that about 10 years ago. And hey, isn't that the truth? Though? It is like, the truth, Chris. It's absolutely the truth. And so they find it easier to change their theology wow. than their order of service. And, uh, and so I, tradition, I th the, the power of tradition. Right, exactly. Yep. Wow. And so uh, I, I think um, th there will be those that will watch this and will say, well, there's been too much change in the, the way that we worship. 
And it's true, there's been a radical transformation. Yep. Uh, there is, there's some of it that I really like, right. and there's some of it that I don't like at all. And it has right. nothing to do with the form. It has nothing to do with the kind of music. No. It has to do with the focus of the message of the yep. worship. And now, when you say of the worship, are you specifically meaning the music, or are you meaning both the teaching and the music? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, all together, like is, worship is service. Taste. Music yeah. is what, This is interesting. Somebody said this to me a long time ago. The kind of music we like is the kind of music we listen to between the ages of 17 and 19. That's and what we like. Fair enough. And you get locked into that you for the rest of your in. life. Yeah. So you got everybody think back. What did you right. listen to between 17 and 19? Right. That's the kind of music you're going to like when you're 55. That's the kind of music that'll be the halftime show when you're about 45 years old. Absolutely. It <laughs> absolutely. It will be. Yeah. And I think that's absolutely right. So to me, music is taste. Because because yeah. of my global experience. Yeah, absolutely. I've seen worship, African worship, you know, a... Uh, 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 <laughs> we were in, in a really remote part of Africa, staying in this in this little bed and breakfast kind of place, and there was a uh, there was a fella who um, we met who was from Germany, and uh, and uh, uh, we found out he was a believer, and he'd never been to this part of Africa before. And, and in this particular context, the Lutherans had sent the missionaries years before, okay. and so the largest group in this part of Africa had Lutheran roots. Okay. And when he told me he was going to go, because he said, they say there's a Lutheran church not far away. He said, I'm going to go. I, I just smiled and thought, <laughs> you're in for some kind of shock if you think <laughs> it that what like... you're going to experience at this Lutheran church in rural Africa <laughs> is anything like the Lutheran church you attend in Germany. Fair we, we, enough. We were back having lunch afterwards, and he came in and he said, that's like no Lutheran church I've ever been to. <laughs> so, and I that mean, was good for him, I bet. It was great. Yeah. Oh, yeah, these people, they're, 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 their worship is, is... So expressive. So expressive. I love, meaningful. I love being with Africans when yeah. we worship. Oh, puts us to shame. When we go to the Dominican Republic for missions and we're building houses down there, we go to their churches right. and first I need earplugs, otherwise I'll have I permanent know, ear true. damage. That's right. But yeah, you go home and just the passion. It's, yeah. it's impactful yeah. in ways exactly. that you kind of forget sometimes yeah. i always feel like i say this to other preachers and they just kind of nod their head in agreement in in north america in most churches when someone's sitting in a service their facial expression doesn't change whether they're having a life-changing experience or yeah. bored out of their exactly. mind right know, the, the right. picture of somebody who's having a life-changing experience is this <laughs> the picture of somebody who's bored and counting how many hours till they have roast dinner is this <laughs> you just know, can't you just can't tell and so sometimes in my early years of ministry i remember looking out going is God doing anything and here? Where are you? And then afterwards, people tell you that changed my life. And you're like, well, maybe wow. you should tell your face. <laughs> I, I, I picked up a book. I want to get back to the other in a second, but I picked up a book one time on a 25 cent uh, uh, table at a Christian bookstore when we used to have those things. Right. And uh, it was called Danger Saints at Work. It was written by, uh, by the wife of an evangelist from the UK. And she was writing about all the funny experiences she'd seen mm. in her husband's evangelistic crusades of uh, Paul Reese. And uh, one of them was the one chapter on testimonies and it gets mm -hmm. to your point exactly she said one time uh, a man got up to give a testimony and he said uh, they used to call me sad Sam, <laughs> but now Jesus has got a hold of my heart and I'm happy all the time <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Oh, I love it. Yeah. Anyways, um, so so you know, is 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 that wrong? That kind of African worship? Of mm. course not. No. Of course it isn't. Is it different than what we have? Right. You bet it is. Right. Well, and now there's African churches in Canada. So if you want to experience, you can go find go Toronto, an African yeah. church somewhere, London, you know, all all across Canada, all sorts of uh, African churches. You know, so so I don't get bent out of shape over music some some of it i like and some i don't it's taste what what i do get concerned about is what's the message that's being mm. projected what are the words of the songs yeah are they focused on christ or are they focused on me and uh -huh. sometimes i think in the church today so much of what we're doing is focused on me and i, I just feel, want to come to church and focus on jesus see i feel that conviction sometimes too because there are some beautifully written worship songs yes. i'm a musician myself and yep. i hear some of these songs and i'm like this is layered and incredibly mastered it's it's moving it's emotional yeah but if I was to take a step back, 
and just yeah. read like cut all of the other instrumental elements out of it and just read the lyrics is it something that would move me or edify me yeah, yeah. i don't know i don't know that it I would know. because it's all about me it's yeah. all about i need this god come to me show right. me fix me help yeah. me yeah. and that has a place but there's just something and i'm sure this is what you're saying here too that when you hear someone preach jesus like not just not just to some felt need, but they yeah. get preaching about the supremacy, the incredible uniqueness of Jesus, the power of Jesus, the what rightful worship is due to yeah. the Son of God who saved yeah. us from our sins. There is something yeah. just that resonates in you. It's like that tuning fork that hits a tune yeah. and just vibrates to whatever that frequency is of humanity. I feel that. Yeah. So yeah, you're right. Like you long for that sometimes Absolutely. when it becomes just a self focus. To, to me, Jesus is everything. Yeah. And he is everything. Amen. And in the church he needs to be and he says if I'm lifted up I will draw all men to myself I must say that in every second prayer that I pray before a service because <laughs> it means something to it me does. It's because to me too it's that promise that if you lift him up that's your job and yeah. my job is to lift him up yes God will draw every man to him you can take Muhammad out of Islam and still have Islam you can take Buddha out of Buddhism mm. and still have uh, Buddhism uh, but you can't take Jesus can't. out of Christianity you don't have anything left you can't you know we're, we're, our, our whole faith is based on the person and work of Jesus Christ Absolutely. on the cross. And, uh, and, and, and I think one of the issues we're having at the moment in the Canadian evangelical church is that uh, we've, we've, we've sometimes set him aside. Mm. And, uh, and, and that's just heartbreaking to me. Lauren Cunningham, he was the founder of YWAM. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you've heard of him. Yes. I read his book, his autobiography once, and there was Wonderful. a scene in there that was just like what you're saying. It was a fascinating mm -hmm. scene where he knew that God had a call on his life, and not only a call on his life, he knew that YWAM was going to grow into something amazing one yeah. day. He had had yes. visions, waves just kind of crashing on the shore of, of workers and ministry that was happening. But they had this one really interesting moment where they had bought a ship that they were going to use for this mercy ship, this kind of this hub that could travel around the world to wherever there was a disaster. And they had bought this ship and they were trying to get ready to pay for it, to, to bring all the donations in. And all of a sudden the donation stopped on a dime. Like money was coming in every day, every day, every day. And then it just like a, like a tap had been turned off. It stopped. And then he went and prayed and asked the Lord what was going on. And he had a vision. And in this vision, I think it was a dream at night that he had, is they were all celebrating the ship. All the YOM people, all the big wigs were celebrating and cheering for the ship. But there was a man in the shadows off to the side. And he was trying to see who that man in the shadows was. And eventually he got a glimpse and realized that the man in the shadows was Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so this whole ministry, this whole move forward, this whole ship and everything, everyone was worshiping and praising the ministry, but Jesus was off hiding in the shadows. Yeah. And they ended up not closing the deal on that ship. It was the dream that had to die before God resurrected yeah. it. And it was this turning point in his life where he realized exactly what you're saying, is if we leave Jesus out of the equation, then eventually everything is going to come to nothing. It will come to nothing, yeah. It's all about him. Mm. And uh, uh, the, the longer I serve in ministry, the more and more uh, I realize how much it's about him. Mm. I, I have nothing else. On the day I stand before the Lord, uh, the God of the universe, um, the only thing that will matter, the only question he will ask me is, what have you done with my son? That's it. It's That's true. the question of questions. It's true. You know, uh, Jesus, uh, you and I have been to Israel together, so yeah. you know how much I love uh, Caesarea Philippi. Yeah. And, um, and, and uh, Jesus uh, asked the question of his disciples standing there in that most pagan place, the mm. most pagan place by, by the gates of hell the, where Pan, the, the, the Greek God, was worshipped. And, mm. and uh, it was literally considered to be the gates of hell, that, this big cave that's at Caesarea Philippi. And uh, Jesus stood in that most pagan place with these niches up in the in the cliff the carvings are still there yeah, even yeah, now yeah. from that time from that time and um and and little god's idols were in there and and jesus said there in the most pagan place of all of israel who do men say that i am hmm. And, uh, you know, they had a, a little theological discussion about that. And that nice as some say, you know, you're Moses, others, Elijah, you know, you're one of the prophets, uh, and, but Jesus wouldn't let it go. Like he didn't, that's nice. That's nice theology. That's nice viewpoint. Hmm. That's nice opinion. We have a lot of opinion in this world today, right? right? Everybody yeah. has an opinion of Jesus, uh, but Jesus didn't let them get away with that. And then he pointed 
focus, brought the focus right into their hearts. And who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? And I think that we need, uh, I think in the Canadian church, we need to get back to that, that simple question. Mm. Who, do we, who do you say Jesus is? And we rise or fall on our view. And, and Peter made that wonderful profession. You are yeah. the Christ. In the middle, that's the most pagan place in all right. of Israel. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. That juxtaposition is just oh, beautiful. Profound. Yeah. Profound. Yeah. There was, it's funny you say that because in terms of a remedy or a prescription for the church in Canada right now, I, I have a really good friend and he honestly is a wonderful guy. He was trained to be a pastor and, uh, and uh, what I'm going to say might sound a little negative, but he is, he loves the Lord with all his heart. He's been in ministry for years and still is in parachurch ministry now, but he interviewed for a church after being in ministry for about 10 years uh, in BC. And as he was interviewing for the church, the senior pastor asked him, what's the gospel? Simple question. What's the gospel? This guy had had three or four years of undergrad uh, education. He had been a youth pastor for three or four years. He's awesome. What's the gospel? And my friend told me, he says, I talked for five or 10 minutes all about the gospel. And then at the end, the pastor said, I'm going to stop you right there. I can tell you right now that this position isn't for you because in all that five or 10 minutes that you were talking about the gospel, you never mentioned that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and rose again. Wow. And I remember hearing that realizing that this wasn't just a story about my friend. Wow. This was a story about the church. Yeah. And this was a story about our educational institutions, our post-secondary educational institutions for pastors, yeah. that somehow someone could make it through three or four years of Bible college and three or four years of ministry and still at that point not be able to answer the question, what is the gospel? Wow. And, and, and I know he grew immensely from that, realizing that he had to be, come back to the heart of what this yeah. was all about. Yeah. But that just blew me away. Yeah. Uh, it just blew me away. And it was a wake-up call for me to realize that if we can't answer that question, it doesn't matter what we're doing elsewhere yeah. in the church. Yeah, I, yeah, I agree with you. I, 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 so th- we're, we're obviously in agreement here that yeah. this is a problem. Uh, I, would, I, would, I wonder how and how many churches in Canada, evangelical churches in Canada. Uh, there's been a sermon in the last few years that just presented clearly the gospel and gave an invitation to respond to it. Right. I wonder. That's a fair question. I don't have statistics. I'm usually the guy that has yeah. all the statistics. So <laughs> well, you're also the, the guy who's traveling around preaching. You, you, I don't know how you do it. You have your day job where you travel around the world a million miles plus one, and then you preach like every second week at our church, which we appreciate immensely too. I love, I love coming but here, by the way. you got a wonderful fellowship here. We, we always appreciate having you. Thank you. Uh, maybe just one or two more things. In Israel, obviously we went there... 12 years ago yeah, now, I think been, 2010. Yeah, I think You've been many been, times since the led times. groups. Yeah, we, yeah, yeah. I remember one funny memory I have is that you and I were watching a Colts game in Jerusalem. <laughs> it was that, like a yeah. Thursday, Thursday night football game. <laughs> I the, the time worked just off. I could hardly watch one here at yeah. home. They never show the Colts games here, but in Israel, I get the Colts game. <laughs> And we were both Colts fans, so this know, was this is kind know. of a dream come true in yeah, Israel, know, looking out of the landscape exactly. and watching the Colts at the. I don't know how well they were doing that night. Well, but, probably uh, better than they're doing this I, year. <laughs> <laughs> but we won't go there. Well, fair enough. If you and 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 again, I'm putting you on the spot, and I don't I don't know if you'll have an answer for this or not. But if you had to answer your favorite one or two places in Israel. You've been there many times. You've been there on many different occasions. If you had to pick one or two that you said these were the most meaningful to me personally, not objectively, but subjectively, what would you say if you had to pick maybe two, two most meaningful places in Israel? Uh, I've been there 11 times, but we're going back again next year from now, October of 2023. It'll be my 12th trip. Uh, There are two places that I, uh, there are three places. Let me answer three. There are three places where I cry every time. Uh, I mentioned Caesarea Philippi. Yeah. I always weep there. Jesus took his his followers to the most pagan place in all of Israel. Most other Jews would be aghast. Mm. They wouldn't even go there. The disciples, I think they went just because Jesus, they loved right. Jesus. And so he, 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 he takes them to this place where all this awful, awful pagan right. religion and perverse sexuality is right. happening. And, and he stands them and takes them here. And it's like, uh, this is where you need to be. Mm. This is where you need to be. It's the intersection. Be. Yeah. Yeah. And I stand there and um, 
I weep. Uh, I, I, I proclaim on, uh, in, in front of this microphone what Peter proclaimed. Uh, every time I go, I, I breathe out the words, you are the Christ, mm. the Son of the living God. If you yeah. profess, if you believe in your heart, or if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So mm. uh, I love Caesarea Philippi, besides the fact it's beautiful. You know, it is. The relief against oh, the mountain there exactly, is gorgeous. Exactly, the little streams that run yeah. down. One of the one of the founding streams of the Jordan River further south. Huh. Uh, and then, huh. I, of course, how can you not love Jerusalem? And there's two places. Um, I, I'm so grateful to my friend Shimon, mm. our tour guide, who manages to get us into the quiet side of the Garden of Gethsemane and a and, uh, place yeah. where we can just worship together there in the garden wander through and just have time with uh with wendy we everybody kind of it's interesting to see how people respond in a quiet side there's the busy yeah. side the public side right. where there's like hundreds of people but there's this other side on the other side of the street that you have to have the little monk has to come and open the gate and you go through and it's just your group just our group in there and yeah. we worship together there's a little place of worship and we sing and we pray and we read the word and mm. and then and then everybody kind of goes off on their own to the garden and i know that the Lord is working in their mm. in their lives, and the other, of course, is the garden tomb. And I know mm. that uh, I know that it's it's the traditional site, and uh, for and, and and we Protestants and evangelicals love it. There, it's quiet, it's right. it's reflective. We we break bread together and have the Lord's supper there, and and uh, and is it the place? I don't know, but but you go into the tomb, and on the back of the door uh, it says. He is not here for his mm. reason. And uh, yeah. whether it's the place or not, that's true. And so, uh, you know, it touches my heart every time. Absolutely. Even just thinking about it, you know, it's a, it's a precious place. Israel is worth the trip. Yeah. And it's so hard to describe to people what it's like until they go. Oh, you like, can't even begin to imagine. I, you could take four years of Bible college and geography and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And in one 10 day trip to have yeah. seen it with your own eyes and experience the sights and the sounds to rehydrate the text. That's how Peterson yes. talks that's about a, it sometimes. Yeah, it's a beautiful way to it's put like it. Rehydrate the text yes. with all the sights and smells and sounds. It's just impactful in a way that's hard to describe. We've had, uh, we've taken hundreds of people to Israel and uh, I, uh, there's, there's a few that have, are, are, are to take two or three trips a year mm. like that, that, that came with us to Israel once or twice and uh, one of them one couple that uh, have, they, they, I, I don't know how they travel as much as they do they said of all the trips we've taken Israel was by far off the chart mm. the most uh, precious of all of our travels we've had yeah. and I hear that from others as well I, I could totally agree with that from my own experience too there's just something jaw dropping about walking on the soil yeah. on the land on the rock that yeah. Jesus walked on yeah. putting your hand in the sea of Galilee where all the miracles happened right. where he walked on there's just yeah, yeah, there's just nothing like that kind of experience. Being, being right at the uh, at the walls in, in Jerusalem and watching under where the Robertson Arch was and you know, dug down and so you're literally, you know, know, know that you're walking on the very same uh, mm. stone. Not just the traditional you know, site, not just is, the, you know, a monk decided one right. time 200 years later. Yeah, this is the place, these, the, these, these sta same paving stones were the very paving stones that Jesus walked on. If someone wrote me a uh, blank check and said, do one thing for this church that you couldn't otherwise, yeah, right? Yeah. Do one thing for this church. You know, you might be tempted to build a bigger building. You might be tempted to hire another staff member. But I wonder if someone, and if anybody wants to write me a check, I would <laughs> certainly not say no. I wonder if the most impactful thing wouldn't be to take everyone who calls yeah. this church home yeah. once wouldn't to Israel gift? for an unrushed, unhurried yes. chance to reflect yeah. and to walk and to see. Yeah. I'd like to take my three uh, adult uh, sons and mm -hmm. their wives and all our grandkids one day that our grandkids be... were all little well except for one right. our granddaughter's a little older but all the rest of them were li too little but one day maybe if the lord passes be cool. we'll be able to take them all over to israel that would be amazing just have a family tour yeah, yeah. Well, hey, Bob, it has been a pleasure to have you on. I have learned a ton already, and we have spent a lot of time together and yeah. already today. I've, I've, yeah. sensed, I've sensed the spirit. I have learned, and I feel, like, I feel like I can see the church and the gospel through different eyes based yeah. on our conversation. So Thanks, thank you. Chris. It's been a joy to be here. And, and I'm so humbled that you invited me to be the first uh, guest on your uh, on the interview part of this podcast. God bless this podcast. I hope it has great impact for Christ. 
in the years ahead. Oh, thank you, Bob. We will be praying for it. Yeah, amen. We we'll, will. We'll talk soon. God bless you, Chris.